Hit a, hit a button. And we're good. Are we good? Beautiful sound system. Well, uh, it's really a huge honor to be here. Um, I was actually born a little bit outside the park in Schenectady. Anybody from Schenectady? Yeah, goes wow, a lot of people from Schenectady. <laughs> Must have been an active hospital there. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, so I just hope what I say is good enough for you to criticize, right? That, and I'm just going to tell you I make stuff up. I just make stuff up. So, you know, you, you decide if it's any good or not. And I enjoy uh, questions and criticism and challenges. And so, you know, don't hesitate. Although I'll tell you, I was the, uh, I was the technology director in the high school where Ferris Bueller's Day Off was made. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're laughing. So, so I understand that sometimes people don't raise their hands, like Ferris Bueller, anyone, somebody. Uh, and then we have people remotely, which Kendra will help manage their questions. And I hope you know, people remotely can get a chance to ask questions as well. Do you have any questions so far? Is, <laughs> anything come to mind? Is, is come to mind? So let me tell you the questions I ask kids. So these days, I always try to figure out what's important. Of all the things you can do with technology, and we're talking a lot of different things, and every day there must be 100 new apps now, right? Overwhelming. <clears throat> the iPad has changed. How many people are now developing tools for, for educators? It's just nonstop. So uh, I can't keep up. Can any of you keep up? I want to know. Who can? Anybody? Keep up? Nobody can keep up. So since we can't keep up, what's really important? What do you focus on? And uh, I still don't know, but I have some ideas. You tell me what your ideas are that you think is absolutely essential, and I'll tell you mine. Um, first, I think the real revolution is not technology. I think it's information. So right from the get-go, I think we, we might not be asking the right questions. We tend to be asking questions about what technology do we need. That's like asking what pencils do we need. It just doesn't matter. Yeah, I'll just give you the answer. It doesn't matter. Because anything you buy today, you're going to throw out. So don't get too excited about whatever it is you buy today. But I would rather ask you what information do you need rather than what technology do you need. I think that's a more interesting question. And the other question, I think, is the core question, is what relationships do you want? So I want to get rid of technology. I just assume everybody has a device. I don't care what it is. And the reason you have a device is to get to information, manage information, create information, do something with information, or are you communicating with one or more people? Those are the two things you do with a device. So I go to schools, and I've learned the first thing to do to figure out what's going on is talk to kids, not teachers. I talk to kids. And one of the first things I ask kids, I just, I just did this a couple times this, this week, is I'll say to kids, what percentage of the work you get can you Google? How much of your work is Googleable? I'm not even sure that's a word, but... Use that word. Googleable. Do you want to know what the answer is, most kids? 95% to 100%. 95 to 100 is Google. Do you think, is that a problem? Is that a problem or is that okay? It's not a problem. It is a problem. I think it's a problem. I'm going to suggest that's a serious, really serious problem. Hugely serious problem because... If that's true, then we have the dumbest generation ever. It, they're going to go to Google, they're going to do it, copy it, and hand it in. Or not just really copy it, but see how it's done. What, may I show you? I, I, I'll show you. Uh, in fact, I, I got some people really mad doing this. <laughs> I, I, got, I make people... Mm. Sometimes I think I'm in the anxiety raising business. I
in the room. Um, well, from alpha, I can solve any math problem, balance any chemical equation, solve for known physics variables, do a study on nutrition. This is quite the website. This is a knowledge engine. This is quite different than a search engine. A search engine uh, finds you stuff that already exists, like an article, a photograph, a chart. A knowledge engine takes a problem that a teacher gives you for an assignment and shows you how to do your homework. It's, it's very different. So um, if I have to solve 6x uh, squared plus 2 equals 8, right? 22. That would be a big number. <laughs> that would be a really big number. Uh, solve. You've got to say solve, otherwise it might take the derivative or the integral. Um, and so we, we, we run that. And it will, it will break down the equation 6x squared plus 2 plus minus 1. And then if I hit step-by-step -step solution, I don't think I logged in today, but if I do, it will show me the step-by-step -step solution, how to isolate for x, solve for x, step-by-step-by-step-by-step. -by -step -by -step -by -step. And um, so I'll just tell you that on, on Monday, I was in a school, and I was meeting with kids, and, and I said, do you know Wolfram Alpha? And it's a very high-performing school. I'm meeting with two kids in AP Calculus. They had never seen it. They, they, had, they had never seen Wolfram Alpha. It will solve any calculus problem and show you how to solve it, step by step by step by step. Change the variables, change the exponent, play with it, really see. And so these two kids, they're looking at me, and they said, wait a minute. We have a teacher who's writing equations on the board, and we're copying them in class. And what we can do is just write our own equations and immediately get the answer. Why are we handling in homework? We could just correct our own homework. We won't have to wait to find out how well we're doing. We can immediately see and can keep going. We don't have to wait for the homework. Do you see that as a problem? I do. I do. I, um, so I'll just keep going for a little while. Is my attitude okay? I think my attitude just you know, <laughs> went off the charts there. Um, so let, let me just tell you, because in, if you haven't seen it, I have a feeling some of you haven't seen it, there, underneath Wolfram Alpha, there's an example link. So you may want to click on examples. And then it will break it down for you. Uh, all the different subjects and the kinds of problems you can solve with Wolfram Alpha. That's a lot. That, 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 that's a lot. Now, in elementary mathematics, just, and I don't want to dwell on math. This is not going to be a math workshop. But I, I, are there any elementary teachers in the room? We have a couple. Good. Do you, know where, do you know where we lose kids in math in elementary school? Word problems. We're pretty good with what's one and one. We're not so good with the train leaves New York at 8 in the morning. We're, we're, we're not so good there. And so elementary math, just to show you, you're going to click on just elementary math. These are the kinds of searches you can do. They're just teaching you. But you can type in word problems in, in Wolfram Alpha. Just type in the word problem, and it will break it down for you and show you how to solve it. Now, at this point... You either think this is cheating, because I can take any problem my teacher gives me, any problem in a textbook, and immediately see the answers and how to break them down. Or you think it's a really great thing. Now we're done with the mechanics. We can teach kids to apply mathematics. We can go on. But I'm, I'm, I'm worried in this country. I'm, I'm worried. I don't think we're doing it. I have a feeling we're not doing it by looking at your faces. I'm worried. There are so many tools that are available now to help people manage their own learning. But you have to ask, what's the added value of a teacher? You have to ask that question. In, in an age where I have so many tools to help me manage my learning, and videos, and tutorials, and interactive models, and oh my gosh, what I can get on the internet, if I want to learn something, it's absolutely amazing. Here, I was in Texas this week, I'll just show you, in iTunes. 
the irony is it, this is blocked in most schools. Um, and that's the other thing I worry about, how much blocking we're doing in our schools. Um, but in iTunes, uh, oh, I just happened to open up. I was, do you know Walter Lewin? He's, he's a retired physicist at MIT. His entire course is online. I was just showing this to some kids the other day. It just happened to be there. Online. Everything. His videos, his assessments, his assignments. It's just, and it's free. It's no charge. It's, it's unbelievable what, what, what you get. But I actually wasn't going to show you that. In iTunes U, there's a K-12 section. There's K-12. Just to show you, K-12. And in um, all kinds of organizations in K-12 all of these, are building courses online. So that's, that's a lot of organizations. And I work with one in Texas called TASA, the Texas Association of School Administrators. That's their superintendents, right? What is it in New York? It's, you've got one, too. Anyway. But look what they've done. They, they have um, they gathered up some teachers for a couple months. Let's see if I can get this. It's accessing the store. And they have 20 courses. You'll see. Uh, let's go see all. 20 courses. <clears throat> you interested in any one of these? Anybody want to see one? Sure. Which one? World Geography. see, World Geography? Where is that? Lower world History? To the left? More Bottom. 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 Bottom row. Bottom row. World geography. Okay, world geography. So I click on world geography. And uh, just like at MIT, the entire course is there. Whoop. Sorry. <laughs> and I go back to uh, world geography. And uh, so we have um, all of these units and videos and exercises and uh, assessment models and interactive maps, probably. I haven't taken the course, but... It's 161 items, and uh, this one does cost $14.99. That's $4.99. I don't know what these things are, but, but most of it's free, and you download it into your iPhone or your iPad or, or, or something. And, and boom, you have an entire interactive course. Now, if you're in Texas, it meets their state standards, right? So you've got all these 20 courses, and... Uh, you don't need textbooks anymore. You just need a device. The sad thing is, most kids in Texas don't know this exists. None of the kids in Texas I can find know this exists. And I think the reason they don't know, maybe their teachers don't know either, um, know this exists, but memos are going out. I was there the day this was launched. I, I did the opening for this launch in this hotel in Austin. And Apple was there. Apple runs iTunes. I bet you know that, right? <laughs> so Apple has this little traffic thing. They can see what's happening with downloads. I don't have that, but Apple did. And they're there this day. And, and the day I'm there, um, I'm talking to the guy that did the pre-calculus class. It's up here somewhere. And he's pretty excited about it, the teacher. And Apple comes over, and, and he asks, how many downloads have we had today? And Apple says, 2,500. And he's thinking it's Texas. And I asked, where are the downloads? The majority were in China. So you've got kids, you've got kids in China downloading a pre-calculus class from Texas, while most kids in Texas don't know it exists. It, I find that odd. I, but I, I think I know why. I think they're more desperate. I think they're more desperate in China than we are. I think there's a greater sense of urgency. I'll, I'll be in Beijing in a couple of weeks. I'm, I'm worried that we don't have an urgency to teach children how to access powerful learning objects on the Internet to help them manage their own learning. I'm really, really worried about that. I'm worried that instead we're trying to keep classrooms exactly as we've had them, but add technology to them. And I would call that the $1,000 pencil. 
So just to start, I think, I think the real revolution is information, not technology. And the question is, what information do you need to be a good learner, to be, right? So the other day, I was, you know, Monday also, just tell you a story from Monday. Monday, this girl says, uh, can you help me? I, I don't know what to do about my probability and statistics course. I'm not doing very well. I said, oh, yeah, well, just go to Khan Academy. You'll see all the videos and the, all the exercises, right? So she didn't know. She, she, just, she just didn't know what was available to her. So I showed her. I said, all right, look, it's Khan Academy, and we'll, we'll go to Khan Academy, and I'll, we'll go to learn, and under here we have all the courses, and that would be in math, and that would be probability and statistics. And here it is, and there's all the course right there and problems across the entire course, and it will give you immediate feedback, thousands and thousands of problems, with all the, the video lectures, everything you need, you can review if you don't understand something. She had no idea that this was available. I think, we are, I think some schools are technology rich and information poor. And that, that's what worries me. We're technology rich, we're after technology, when I think we should be after information. So it's really interesting to me to meet with any group of kids and say, okay, where are you not doing well in school? What subjects, where are you struggling? Tell me, tell me where you're struggling. Kids know where they're struggling. I'll say, all right, well, you should get this, and you should get that, and you should get this, and you should get that. We could do that for every kid every day. We, but are we, right? That's, that's the question. Are we hooking kids up to resources? Now, I... I can accept that if you don't have the internet, I understand that. You don't have the internet, you don't have a device, you can't do this. But I'm assuming some of you do, right? It's... Any questions? Are we? We're a very quiet group. Ferris? <laughs> Ferris? Bueller? Are you... Yes? So when, they ask, when you ask them that question, yeah. if you don't know the answer... If I, I don't know the answer, ask me a question. I ask, before I answer, I, I have to connect this to another, another. Sometimes I'll ask kids, do you know how to use Google? By the way, every kid says yes, yeah. which we're going to get to in a moment. And, and, and then I'll, sometimes I'll say, who has never used Google? I was doing this in a really fancy private school, Bermuda, a couple of weeks ago. And this little fourth grader says, that's not possible. If you have a question, you have to use Google. So that's my answer to you. Google it. It's, if you want to learn something and you don't know how well you're doing, go find the resources. You don't even need me to tell you. But I don't think we're teaching our kids to build their own learning ecology. I don't think we're doing that. What I think we're doing is we're making them dependent on a traditional model of education that lesson plans and tests and activities and videos and conversation, you have to wait for those to happen. And I don't think adding technology to that model is going to get us very far, I think. I just don't think. I'll give you another example. I, 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 uh, the other question I like to ask kids is show me Show me an assignment you did where you use Google. Show me how you use Google. Because that, I think, I think Google is the number one source for kids doing homework. It's, it's not Khan Academy, and it's not Wolf and Alpha because they haven't been taught to use those well, but I think it's Google. And they think they know how to use Google. So I'll just show you an example. This one... A high school student said, yeah, I got an A on my Iranian hostage crisis paper. And I said, all right, well, show me how you do that. And he types in Iranian hostage crisis like this. <laughs> hostage, hostage, host, hostage crisis. Actually, he's better spelled than I am. Um, types in Iranian hostage crisis. And it's Wikipedia. So uh, one of the most interesting things 
when you look at the research and student behavior, is that the research says the overwhelming majority of your students only look at the top screen of results when they do a Google search. Do you agree with that? Yes. Because we have to, I just find out what you agree with. And, and they'll, they might do three searches, and after three searches, the majority of students give up if they don't find it. So they only look at top screen, right? Oh, and one more. They don't change search engines. Whatever search engine starts the search, it ends the search. They don't change search engines. So their repertoire is not very good. And their stick with itness is not very good. So one of the most important questions I think a teacher can ask is what's missing? Because stuff's always missing, right? What's missing? So I asked this boy, we're looking through Wikipedia, PBS, CNN, we got, we got a government site, we got the New York Times, this is before Argo came out, but um, Britannica. And uh, I said, what's missing? And he said, nothing's missing, I got an A, That's, I use those sources. Nothing's missing. I said, yeah, something's missing, really important. What's missing? What's missing? The Iranian side. The Iranian side's missing. Nothing from Iran. So I, I had to point, I pointed that out. I said, he, didn't, he didn't come up with that. No. Nope. And uh, I said, can you, can you get Iranian sources? He said, yeah, no problem. I can get Iranian sources. He types in Iranian sources. Just like that. Iranian sources. That's spelled right? Yeah. And he gets Wikipedia. Yeah. And he gets, you know, there's some other things now, but no Iranian sources. You get Jimmy Carter Library. No Iranian sources. PBS again. So he's struggling, he's struggling, he's struggling. He can't get Iranian sources. And I, I said, okay, well, no problem. We'll, we'll show you how to do it. And uh, so there's this concept you probably know called country code. And then I type in internet. And I can get these lists of websites that have the two-letter country code listings um, lined up. So there's two-letter country codes. And he had never seen this. He didn't know this was a concept. So Iran, where's Iran? IR. But be careful, Iceland is IS. There's no S in Iceland. So you, you, you can't just memorize. You have to, I have to look them up. I, I, I get always messed up if I memorize. But uh, so I are. And, and he's getting bored, by the way, at this moment. And he says, so? And I said, well, look, so the so is Google has magic powers like this word called site, colon, I R. So if I type in site, which is an operator, it's a very special word in Google, gives you magic power then everything is in Iran. I just tried to prove the point that now we're, we're, not, we're not here anymore. We're, we're somewhere else. And, uh, and he doesn't know what to do with that. And, <laughs> and I said, well, OK, site colon IR. By the way, the word site is what's called an operator. Google has 16 operators. They have magic power. And they give you much more precision over your search. And I think we should teach kids to be precise. I think if you're, if you're random, it's not so good. If you're more precise, a little better. A little better if you're more precise. So I think one of the first things we should do with information is teach kids how to rip off the world well, right? <laughs> if you're going to rip off the world, do it well. And uh, so now we're in Iran, IR, site colon IR. And then here comes the more interesting part. So I said, uh, can you finish your search for your assignment now? Because now we're in Iran, what are you going to do? And honest to gosh, she types in Iranian hostage crisis. <laughs> and I said, do you think the Iranians called it the Iranian hostage crisis? <laughs> and we're talking about that. We have a little conversation. And uh, he, he agrees to change his perspective and type in the American hostage crisis. You can't do that in Texas, but you can do it in New York. American hostage crisis. And you've got to throw in Carter. And, and uh, Ben Affleck could be hanged for war crimes. So you don't get that in the United States. You don't get that. You get Ben Affleck should be nominated for Academy Award, right? Academy Award hung for war crimes. That's a difference in perspective. 
and then you get more and more and more and more. So uh, then I said, look, you know, you want to get your paper. It's not about Ben Affleck being hanged. It's about what happened. Type in ac.ir. Now you only get higher education in Iran. So that gets rid of Ben Affleck. Now we're getting more precise. And so I'm talking to this kid, and, and, he, and I said, are you going to college? You know, because when you get out in the world, you're going to have to find good quality information, depending on what your job is and what problems you're solving. Getting information is like the lifeblood, don't you think? If you don't have the right information, you could end up making it worse. Am I boring, everybody? You look it's so quiet looking. Are you thinking or are you bored? Sometimes it's the same look. You know, you don't know. You don't know what's going on. But now, here comes the provocative idea, right? Which I bet many of you are already there, but just in case, here's my concern. In the age of paper, there is no Iranian sources in the library. Teacher doesn't have to worry about Iranian sources because they don't exist. Be before the web, can we agree? You're not going to have Iranian sources. You're not going to have Iranian newspapers. You're not. Library is going to have all Western sources. That's as far as you're going to get in a high school is a library. And not in this particular case, but chances are you don't have any primary source documents either. There's no primary source material, which we'll get to in a moment. So in the world of paper that we're coming out of, you can actually be a little bit looser about giving an assignment. I used to be a history teacher. You can be a little bit looser because you know the kids don't really have access to a lot of information. And any access they do have has probably already been pre-selected by an adult. A library, librarian, a teacher, it's already been pre-selected and they're safe, they're inside of that shell of a library. Or... So you can give an assignment without as much direction as I think you need to give with the internet. With the internet, I actually think because it's more of a mess and not pre-selected and global, that teachers actually have to give more structure to the assignment than in the world of paper. I don't think we can just dust off assignments we gave in the world of paper and send kids out to go do them. Well, we are, but I don't think we should. I think, for example, the teacher could have said, you, get, you need to get two Iranian sources. You know, they could have built that in to the assignment. And maybe the teacher should have shot, shown the kids how to do it. Site colon, IR. I even think that with any assignment, we should build capacity for kids to do good quality search right in the assignment, right, right there. Because a lot of kids don't know how to search. I'll show you more in a moment. And then you may want to even have conversation in class about what's the perspective. Is it... It's Iran, so what kind of search terms would you use? What, but what, what I think is happening to this boy, in fact, I know what happened to him, is I'm pretty confident that the Iranian hostage crisis was an assignment that was given before the Internet was invented. I'm pretty confident. And teacher dusted it off and gave it to the kid again. How many times does that happen across how many subjects? So moving forward, I don't think the real work is technology. I think it's redesigning all of our assignments. More structure, more capacity, more perspective, more primary source. We'll, we'll get to that. And that's what I think is the real work. Plus, if you're giving things that are Googleable, it's OK that they're Googleable. I'm not against everything that's Googleable, but if it is Googleable, do it well. I, don't just find American Western sources on a rent. OK. So the concept is, should we be redesigning our assignments, or can we keep the assignments with new technology? That's 
Big question. Which assignments do we redesign? Is this a good question? Are you, are you interested? I, mean, I, try, I don't want to bore you. Uh, any questions on anything I've done so far? Mechanics or? Curious? Yeah? Uh, Sorry? Yeah. AC replaces EDU in most of the rest of the world. So in New York, you have EDU, and like NYU.edu. Most of the rest of the world has an abbreviation for academic called AC. So in Japan, in the United Kingdom, in Iran, it isn't EDU, it's AC. And it's always with the two letters of a country code outside the United States. So for example, uh, if I were studying Romeo and Juliet, and uh, I might type in file type, that would, that's an operator. Different, obviously, than site, file type. And then PPT, that's the extension of files made with PowerPoint. So I'm only going to get PowerPoints. And then site, then I'll add another operator, site colon ac.uk. That's only British universities. And then I type in Romeo and Juliet. So at this moment, I have Romeo and Juliet. So at this moment, I have 104 PowerPoints on Romeo and Juliet. If I change the ac.uk to edu, then I have them in the United States, 700. So now I have 800 PowerPoints on Romeo and Juliet from universities, and some of these are gorgeous. Oh my gosh, the graphic designers they can access as a professor, gorgeous. The world does not need one more PowerPoint on Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> There's a thousand. Knock yourself out. No, but seriously, so the assignment redesign. OK, so here's the thing. In, in, in the current model, I'm going to take a wild guess that some English teacher is going to go home and design a PowerPoint on Romeo and Juliet and show their class on a $5,000 interactive board. And the class is going to be sitting there taking notes on the teacher's PowerPoint. I bet that's not an uncommon. Or you show the kids 10 PowerPoints, five from the UK and five from the United States in teams, three, four, or five kids in a team. And they go through the slides of these 10 PowerPoints, and they pull out slides and make an 11th PowerPoint on some theme the teachers come up with. But the kids have to build the PowerPoint from the 10 from Great Britain and the US, right? Which one would you rather do as a kid? Sit and have a teacher deliver PowerPoint that she spent an hour, two hours creating? Teachers work too hard. Go out for dinner. <laughs> Come to the Wild Center. I mean, no, it's true. It true. Teachers work their tails off. Give yourself a break. Sometimes less is more. Do you know what I mean by that? I think teachers could work less hard and we could get more learning. That'd be cool. <laughs> Don't you think? So, the other question I have for you is who's working harder? The teacher or the students? Who's working harder? Seriously. And you know what? I walk through schools. I walk left, right. I look at classrooms. Almost inevitably, like I'm doing now, I'm working harder than you. Uh, the, the teacher's working harder. I think the kids should be suffering more. They should be working harder. <laughs> That's one of my goals. I want to design a school where the kids work harder than the teachers. I think we can do it. I actually think we can do it. And it can be fun. And along the way, I don't know, do you like the idea that you've just taught kids to rip off professors in England and the United States? <laughs> now you've taught them to cheat. But even though you taught them to borrow other people's content, the design of the assignment, looking at 10 PowerPoints and making an 11th, that's called remixing, by the way, word for that. It's legal, as long as you cite properly. I think that's actually an interesting assignment. So that's just another redesign the assignment.
Any other questions? Th this side of the room is winning. Do you, do you have any questions? Anything at all? You want to learn something? No? Fine. I'm not talking to you. Yeah? So where does the teacher go to learn how to be an expert Googler? Great question. <laughs> that's the answer. That's the answer. Now, that does bring, I mean, the laughter and the joke, that was good timing. Whoever said that, I owe you big time. I teach a doctoral class, and uh, I've learned not to answer my students' questions if they're Googleable. That's Googleable. But I'm going to tell you, I'm a guest, so I'm going to tell you. Um, you're, you're not my real student, so I better, I better be, be, be good, I better behave myself. Um, so, so far, I said they're called operators, and we're in Google. That's it. Google operator. And uh, so you could get any number of uh, Google's websites, support Google, that tell you how to use the web, Google. And uh, so if I go back one, uh, the other one, Google Guide. Search operators. These are the operators. So far, I've used site and file type. If you haven't been taught that those exist and how to apply them, and somebody else has, it's not a fair fight. It's just not a fair fight. I'll get Iranian sources. I'll get content I want. I'll get boom, boom. And watch kids. Three tries, they're out. Do you believe what I'm saying? Yeah. Three tries, they're out. And uh, information's the lifeblood of solving problems. Common Core is coming, right? No, it's here. Okay, it's here. <laughs> oh, this is New York. Oh, you had a bad experience here, didn't you? <laughs> this is New York. I remember what happened to your test scores. Okay. <laughs> fine. Fine. All of a sudden, your kids got dumber overnight, right? Okay. Fine. Board of Regents. Got to love those guys. Okay. Um, ear mouse. Let's do a common core kind of example. Here's a design of an assignment. Let's, let's take... Let's take a photograph off the web. Common Core. Uh, that's an interesting picture, don't you think? By the way, I give a lot of talks to kids. I've got to get their attention. This works. Trust me. This, this, this works. And, and so we got the ear coming out of the mouse. And uh, what I'm going to do, so Common Core, right? Everybody in the room. For those of you who are not educators, here's, here's the big change. The old days of assessment design is you got a paragraph and multiple choice questions, and you knew the answer was in the paragraph. Or you knew the answer was in the, in the math problem. You knew it was there, you stared at it, you tried to figure out what's the answer. In the new assessment, you get three, four sources of information, not one paragraph. It could be a couple of photographs, some text, and one of them is misleading and you don't know which one. And now you've got to figure out the answer. That's a lot more complicated then here's a paragraph, what's the answer? So let's, let's do it. Uh, so here's a photograph, and uh, here's some text. So if you don't mind, you'll be my class, right? Just read the first sentence. How did the ear, the question is, how did the ear get on the back of the mouse? And uh, so please start with the scientist and end up with a liver, right? How did that happen? So give you a moment. All good. And then uh, we will um, do that search again. And I'm going to come up with another source, Wikipedia, which has uh, roughly the same photograph. And I'd like you to read that part, that bit, from the canty to mouse. One. And same question, how did the ear get on the back of the mouse? And if... You're like me, there's two different explanations now. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. So now the question is, 
Which one is true? Is it the BBC? Is it Wikipedia? Is it a third source? Is there another explanation in the world? How did the ear get in the back of the mouse? By the way, on the internet, there is more than one explanation for a lot of things. <laughs> there is no shortage of assignments you can build like this. I think it's actually fun. Um, so I'll tell you what, you're on that. Go talk to each other. I've been talking too long. Figure this out. What's your strategy for validating whether something is true or false? Have you been taught the rigor and the discipline of taking things that do not agree and figure out where's the truth, if there is any? So two or three minutes? Okay. Talk to each other, call a friend. I don't care how you do it. <laughs> Whatever device you have, use it. You, use your device. Call your mouse specialist. Call, call anybody. I'll be slower. But they're not asking much. Yeah. They will. Oh, it's for the broadcast. Okay, so at this point, that should be enough, right? Then, uh, so I give this kind of stuff to kids. I'm a, I, like, I like this general structure that you show two things that don't agree and you get people to figure out without telling them the answer, right? And then you watch how they do it um, and then see if you can add any value. Um, So I, I'll share with you some experience of how with kids. I'll give this problem to kids, and immediately some kids raise their hand without any hesitation. I say, oh, you know the answer? And they'll, they say, yeah, I know the answer. It's obvious. And I'll say, oh, what's the answer? They say, the BBC is right. And I'll say, how come the BBC is right? And they'll say, well, my teacher told me not to trust Wikipedia. <laughs> so I'm just paying attention to what my teacher told me. You know that's true, don't you? You know that's true. Okay. So, just to make things more complicated, the BBC is absolutely wrong. It's the Wikipedia article that's correct. And so just don't worry about... So that's the answer. But I don't really care about the answer. I care about how we got to the answer. Right? Because you can't just tell people it's the answer. They, they don't believe you. Because Wikipedia is so suspect because anybody can contribute to it. And the BBC has this professional process of editing. So the way I did it, I'll show you how I did it, and then you can tell me if you did it in a different way. Um, well, conceptually, what's the single most important source in the world to go to? Where would you go next? Everybody says get a third source. Everybody says get a third source. But the question is which third source? The original, original. The original, original, original. Right. Primary source. Turns out a lot of kids don't know what a primary source is. They think the encyclopedia is a primary source. I say, no, no, no. Some guys wrote that. They didn't make it. Somebody, they're just writers. They're just editors. They, that's not primary source. So we've never had primary sources in school. So we've never really taught kids what's the primary source. So now we have to teach this concept called primary source. I'm convinced of this. Um, so I think it's the lab where it was done. I think, where was this done? Who did it? And do they have any documentation in the original place? Because I don't want an article. It, it's it's uh, suspect to me. So I take sight. And I scan through. And three 
universities are mentioned in some sources I looked at. University of Massachusetts, MIT, Children's Hospital, that'd be Harvard teaching. So MIT is the easiest to spell. So I, MIT. <laughs> Dot edu. That's my only selection. MIT.edu. That holds it. Oh, site will hold to any extension or domain name. So MIT.edu, that's called a domain name, part of the web address. So that's all MIT, nothing but MIT. Okay. And then they both agree. Then I try to find some agreement that I hope is true. They both mentioned Vacanti, and it is an ear. And it is a mouse. That's, that's as far as I can you know, go in the beginning. Just agreement. Where I'm pretty confident we're talking about the same thing. And uh, so then I go through this ear on a new mouse scaffold. Some big words I don't know. I've got to look those up. But uh, transplantation surgery. It, it turns out that when you go through this content and you look at it, it was transplanted. It was implanted sub... I can't even say that word. Um, you'll have to help me. Um, so it did not genetically grow out of the back of the mouse. Didn't do that. At least MIT says. They line up with Wikipedia. And then if I did the same thing at harvard.edu and um, just change that, um, we can check another potential primary source because teaching hospitals. Uh, and then we take a look at this, the canty, tissue engineering, more big words, um, <laughs> cartilage and the shape of a human ear, right? So to me, that's like it was sewn in the back of the mouse. So, but I worry as I watch kids, and I really think teachers should watch students on the internet, I, I, I think we need to learn how our kids are finding information. And then as you watch them, help them build their repertoire of search skills. Yeah? Any questions on the mouse? Do you agree with me? It's not the BBC. A little sensational there. Took license with the English language. Well, a couple of weeks ago, it was South Park, so I worry about that. Um, but it's a good question. It's a very good question. If we went to the source, it's a great idea. I, I, I love your idea. I, I, the joke was just a joke. The, 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 uh, it's a children's hospital. Yeah? But I'm not making this up a few weeks ago. So it was South Park also, a little weird thing. Um, pardon? Well, I like Wikipedia. You just have to, but you also have to be careful with the BBC. See, see, I don't mind that people think Wikipedia is suspect. I'm good with that. Just be suspect on everything. Don't pick on Wikipedia. And we've never really taught kids to question the encyclopedia. There's a lot of errors all over the place. Can we agree? Uh, you can't say that's reliable. It, 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 not anymore. Um, so I, I just offer, for those of you who have to prepare kids for Common Core, um, I actually think the design of an exercise similar to this one compare and contrast versions of the truth, at least begin to teach kids to question. OK. Any, any other observations? Or? You know what's too bad in a way that you didn't bring kids with you today? <laughs> kids are more interesting. <laughs> and you know that's true. You know that's true. You know they ask more questions. You know they raise their hand more. Adults are a little bit more reticent. Don't trust me. I present to both groups. I, I present to both groups, and kids will ask questions. How'd you do that? How'd you do this? Where else? Can I do another one now? You know, it's, it's really interesting to, to the difference between an adult audience, even educators, 
and kids. It's so different. You should sit in my shoe or stand. Really, you should see. So think about if kids were sitting next to you and you said, what do you think about that? What would they tell you? Right? So you got to think like a kid in, in a way. You got to, uh, I think, think like a kid. Uh, and I, I know I, I didn't mean to insult you unnecessarily. Um, <laughs> but kids are interesting. Uh, not when they get to high school, they slow down a little bit. But elementary, middle school kids, oh my gosh, how much fun can you have? Um, all right, so let me just check. Is it really an hour? Seriously? I'm over. Thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, we'll take a break, right? We're a yeah. scheduled break. When we come back, I'll just keep going. Is that right? Yeah. Just keep going. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to have questions, people challenge. I don't want you to accept this is all good. You should challenge me. Uh, but we'll take a little break. It says so on the schedule. Um, I hope you come back. So we're going to take a 15-minute oh, break. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Uh, 9.50. Because I'm late, right? 9.